us. Several has over two hundred several areas of public public policy. Current research Higher education governance policy and COVID 19 and political institutions, public sector management, Ghana's fourth republic. Shall we please welcome him with a clap? President of the Ghana Times, past president, vice president, fellows of the academy, my dear students, it is and gentlemen. Today is day three, and as we wish, the national order changing world in education, schools, institutions, norms, alliances. Ghana. Yesterday we have two interesting lectures. The sub team changing national order. Had Ali Eku, having a broadcast. Daniel Ose. So yesterday, I took three. First one is that whether we like it or not, international environment change. Second thing that I also learned that trust is important. That uh, people decide uh, or leaders decide to draw treaties, decide to withdraw from pensions, trust, very important. That in spite of the problems facing multilateralism, still need it, deal with wicked problems like climate change, things like, like terrorism, issues such as pandemics. Evening. That interesting aspect of the of this uh, um, will continue on the sub team drivers for an effective and sustainable rule-based international order. One is hunting terrorism, violent extremism, expanding frontiers of threats is Africa, the imperative of regional National topic two is on new spheres of influence, Africa's peace, peace and development. He pathways Ghana's. Our speakers are Professor Kwesi Eni and Dr. Linda Dakwa. I will introduce them when they start talk, no interruption. Finish with them. I'll come back to question. Professor Kwesi Enin is full professor and director, Faculty of Academic Affairs and FAAR. 
Ghana International Peacekeeping Training Center. His experiences from the African Union AU as his first expert counter terrorism 2005 to 2007. He wrote the independent midterm in depth evaluation of the global program on strengthening the legal re regime against terrorism in 2006, 2014, and in 2008, a UN Secretary General's report on the African Union relating to peace and the United Nations until January 2019, served on the UN Secretary General's advisory group for the Peace Building Fund. 2020, together with two others, joint offer of the Conflict and Development Analysis, Ghana, Accra, UNDP, August. July 2022, was appointed as a member of the World Food Programs Security Advisory Board, SCCAB, provide high level insight, management, technical issues at strategic level, and to modernize WFP security management, deliver safer operations. Specializes in peace, peacekeeping, economies, hybrid security, political orders, peace building strategy, and organized crime. Ladies and gentlemen, then I'll go on to introduce Dr. Linda Dakwa. Dr. Linda Dakwa is an academic practitioner in the areas of peace, security, governance, Gender, senior research fellow of the Legon Center for International Affairs and Diplomacy. This year, Dr. Dakwa also provides strategic advice to three international civil, civil society organizations and the African Union's Department of Political Affairs, Peace and Security, under the umbrella of the Training for Peace. These include advice on key policy processes as well as norms relating to peace, peace support operations, gender and post, conflict reconstruction and development. 2022 was appointed a member of the experts on the review of the African Union's PCRD policy. The DACWA is a member of the technical committee of the TANA Forum, editorial board of the Contemporary Policy Journal and the Council for Foreign Relations, CFR, Ghana. She is also an advisory board member of the Swedish Armed, Armed Forces International Center and a co convener and senior fellow, IFG 9, Sustainable Regional Peace Building of the Marian Institute of Advanced Studies, Africa. Her publications include Democracy Oil and political stability, West Africa, pathways to managing contested spaces, the African Review 46, 2019, pages 292-308, presentation of the duty of care by the African Union in AD federal editors, the duty of care of international organizations so as their civilian personnel, 2018, MC, ISA, Press. Monetarian Intervention, Aterina, P. Coleman and Thomas Tieku, African Actors in International Security, Shaping the Contemporary Norms, 2018, in Vietnam. The African Standby Force, Africa's Regions to the Maintenance of Peace 2017, a contemporary security policy. African Union, the phenomenon of foreign fighters, Africa, 
A D good F F Caponi and C Paul Lucen, editors, foreign fighters under international law and A M C A Star Press after ladies and gentlemen. So my turn now, my pleasure to call on. Ghana and West Africa faces public and security conundrum based on old unresolved fundamental security. These old challenges are foisted new and ever expanding threats in environmental security, all arms, epidemics, politically motivated violence, lessening civil military, creating a toxic mix, mix that is threatening. To respond to these require innovative thinking bold and swift political leadership, democratic intervention, front such interconnecting problems, domestic regional itself. Sub-region that is now characterized both as the center of expanding terrorism. Today's lecture confronting terrorism, violent extremism, and then frontiers of threats, states in Africa, the imperative of regional and national action encapsulates the understanding of the threat, the popular and stylized presentation of facts to create a particular threat narrative. Political ends, the weakening of and cognitive dissonance that characterizes regional initiatives for responding, expanding frontier as captured in the lecture. Chair, this evening I intend to do six things. First, lay out the argument that to confront terror and violent extremism, a better appreciation of understanding narratives and discourse around the notions of it. Two, that we cannot discuss these topics without locating them within a rule-based international a changing world and its institutions, norms, and alliance formation, which is the broader theme. Thirdly, I argue that the very title of the lecture brings into question issues of methodology ethics of how insecurity and threats are constructed and framed that impact on imperatives, choices. Fourth, I examine the continental and regional efforts in tackling these challenges, but for the purposes of time, we'll focus on ECOWAS. Number five, I'll focus on Ghana's intervention. I'll highlight some thoughts. So what is the context within which this topic has been? Violent conflict remains the primary driver of terror. But 88% of the attacks, 98% of terrorism-related deaths in 2022 taking place in countries, countries most impacted by terror in 22 are also involved in Attacks in countries involved in conflict are seven times deadlier than those. 
the end result is that terrorism is dynamic and continues there, Burkina Faso, Mali, Togo, Nigeria. Sub Saharan Africa has recorded its highest increase in terrorism related. Almost 5,023 people have died. And it's the highest number globally. Chair, what is the nature of the relationship amongst the main terrorist groups? And how can it be explained? I trace the growth and expansion of three main groups Slavic states in West Africa province and their emergence in Nigeria. Also, speak about Islamic State. The Greater Sahel and JNIM. Let me speak about Islamic State. It emerged in Nigeria and can be traced to Abu Bakr Shikau, ideological shift away from March 7, 2015. Shikau pledged allegiance to Islamic State Central. However, Shikau's leadership of Islam was not widely recognized by the broader Islamic State framework. Consequently, in August 2016, IS Corps, created in Iraq and Syria, elected Shikau's leadership. Subsequently, appointed Awi ally as the new leader, setting the stage since relevant in the terrorist networks of West Africa. Chicago rejected to be responded to the rejection by reclaiming Iraq. I argue this is the basis for the contestations and the violence that we see in eastern Nigeria increasingly spreading to the whole of North and capturing territory. Cameroon. The second is Islamic State in the Greater Sahel, formed in 2015 because of a leadership crisis in Al Al Tum, operating in northern Mali. Prior to the formation of ISGS, Abu Walid Al Al Rawi attempted to assume the leadership after a vacuum, following the death of Abu Bakr Asri. Mukta Bel Mukta in 2014 started the process of creating a fighters who were personally loyal to him. This created continued tensions and confrontations, consequently led to Rawi. ISGS has been formally incorporated province by an order from IS. Both ISWAP and ISGS are ideology, a part of a global IS despite the fact graphically and ideologically ISWAP I is come from two origins. New allegiances and alliances formed by these originally distinct groups constituted a fundamental and shift in their operational practice. Example, a key distinction between Iswap and Book that was the latter conscious attacks on both Muslims and Christians. And in fact, all those who oppose the Sharia, Islamic State in West Africa province prioritizes targeting only non-Muslims, military structures, governments. A lot of cases provides better social welfare and facilities. Another fundamental distinction in Iswap and 
and ISWAP provides essential services to communities. Although ISWAP, as we all know, still employs violent, coercive methods, they have been able to establish a symbiotic relationship with the inhabitants. This shows extent poverty. A third interesting group is JNIM, meaning the support group, an Al Qaeda affiliated group based in Mali that has now expanded its operations in Afasu, Niger, Senegal and has had two attacks in the northern part of the new oh. Given that JNIM is an alliance of four separate jihadist groups, goals and objectives of the regionally specific. JNIM focusing its influence across Mali and Interestingly, this particular group seeks to preserve relations with local communities to expand their operational reach. The organization also relies heavily on the idea of unity. So we need to begin a process following statements from these groups. And there's a, there's, there's a very subtle shift from writing in Arabic and now issuing their statements. We cannot talk about this without locating it within an international order. The international order as we knew it has changed dramatically from bipolar to bipolar. An increasing flexible ad hoc multipolar, which is almost a la carte. Rule-based behavior or move That the values and the norms that guide and shape states' behavior on the international scale has been replaced by an ever-shifting and opportunity behavior and an alliance system almost devoid of. The efficacy of institutions, either national or multinational, affected relating to the norm. Context equals an African Union. Rules are explicit or, or understood regulations or principles that should govern the conduct and procedures within a particular activity. Although values, Chair, are not mentioned title, values are key since they encompass general ideals, trigger the norms, which are action-guided rules, rising of permissions, orders, and inhibitions. These issues have become pertinent within the context as the recent upsurge in military coup d'etat issue. Stopping the expanding extremists are challenging the normative frameworks the Kuwasi security community faced. Recentering the military in West Africa poses in a very direct manner an existential crisis. With four states, Guinea, Mali, Burkina Faso, and challenging the very normative framework of the Kuwasi security agenda is founded and having been suspended raises fundamental ethical issues. Mali has also been by Sahel about the Accra Initiative. Rising climate. Togo. But with Mali, Burkina Faso, and suspended from any from the Ecuador. What this means in practice, Chair, is that the whole of the Eastern 
where the violence is created are under the military rule, currently suspended. Political convergence criteria have been breached. What explains the multivariate application of ECOWAS's normative framework and its ad hoc application by equally ad hoc such as the G5? But this raises issues of methodology, ethics, and the imperatives of choice making. Check. How does one explain the narratives around the construction of the extreme threat and the so called expansion, supposed drive down to the south? I seek to challenge. Several explanatory frameworks have been provided. Clarify the developments that have now earned the littoral states the unenviable title as West Africa's new front. European Union foreign policy chief Joseph Borrell posits that the attacks that we see, quote, show that terrorism is spreading. And as a result, violent extremism organizations, quote, are seeking to establish a presence in Togo as part of a broader end drive. Another strand of the expansion argument has been propounded by the Timbuktu Institute in Senegal, that these groups, quote, want to get over to, to reach the coast. Togo, Northern Ghana, and Benin coming, quote, ideal staging points, others hiding in the forested areas or isolated locations along the I've traveled in northern Ghana. I've traveled in northern Togo. I've been in the forests of Benin. There is an almost personalizing. What strategic use is where you can get access to weapons, gold, explosives? Travel from southern Burkina Faso, 900 kilometers. Where's the army? Why should they travel from the northern part of Togo, from Kunjuari, all the way to Lome? My argument is very simple. There is a broader need for us. The aim of such an overstretch, the Timbuktu Institute argues, quote, is to allow violent extremist organizations access to the sea via West African ports, possibly new networks for acquiring weapons. But the originalists are watched with weapons. 12 million unregistered in this country, 4.5 million unregistered. Why do they need to come to Takrade and come to Tema? No. Have Accra dollar power to the gold available. The labs say yes, <laughs> are selling the gold. So there is a fallacious argument that is being made. I posit that such arguments are not only fallacious and spurious, but also demonstrate stylized discourses that infuse our security political analysis, the so-called expansion of a terrorist threat, and seeks to fit it into such interpretations, a universalizing narrative terrorists seeking to. The data that we have, that both in Mali, Burkina Faso, particularly in Niger, Southward drive ceased. That the number of attacks are not as high as we think. But just for the sake of the argument, if they are expanding, effectively, that's what we call threats. If 5,300 people have died over the last three years across 15 countries, 
What it means is that there are 4.3 deaths. Calculate that traffic accidents, then the violence by terrorism kills. So we need to ask ourselves tough questions. Why this particular argument? So, chair below, I try to present three possible explanatory frameworks of the supposed southward drive. First, the available evidence and my own field work show that there are perfectly explainable rationales for the supposed expansion down south. From 2019, Okinawa authorities initiated the Otapuano military operation resulting in the disruption of several JNIM, ISGS cells and fighters. In several interviews, both in Togo and in Benin, very senior people, July and August of this year, they told me on a number of occasions, quote, the extremists live with us. They come from within the communities. In fact, a recurring theme in my interviews was that, quote, other groups are exploiting the situation for their benefit, and that the very word terror ought not to be the analytical frame of what is happening. Second, is that while attacks have taken place, a legitimate every single a concerns violence and the narrative. And I argue that it's highlight several current These include but not limited to banditry, criminal networks, struggling for turf expansion, dating to the illegal trade in small arms, oil, petrol, soya bean, Gold and in In this country alone, those who seek to exploit the terrorists have 21 border outlets out of this country. And it's not human. Donkeys trained. So we need to look at this so-called expansion through the lens of a political level. But those who made this impression, and as we sit here, we know in quite a number of these countries, well, gold, ammunition, come. Reference. Third, as a result of this so called spread and recruitment drive, it has been asserted that in three years the region has suffered 5,300 terror related attacks that have claimed thousands. As compared to annual road traffic accidents in West Africa, comparison from several sources, including organizations. Oh, hello. Last year, had more than 600 groups with accident death. They are methodological issues and ethical issues. What I've sought to do from the above is that we need to understand the multiple contexts in which domestic and, and response strategies are presented. Us. Furthermore, that we need to understand also how we should locate actual continued presence. And I argue that we, should, we need to do this from two sources. First, we need to understand the possibility for an external penetration. You know? And two, the possibility 
domestic recruitment arising from the opportunities created by several structural factors. That would be Chair, we have several questions I argue. Rapidity, the narrative. And it leads But I argue that because of this specializing narrative, aid capacity, porous borders, and particular political of the nature of the threat is undertaking, we need to ask some fundamental questions. First, how is the threat initially? Because if you travel to the places I traveled, quarry, coming to Senkase, coming to either Ga uh, and continue, number of being occurrence, nine months. Under what condition? Number two, what is the quality and capacity of states to prevent and deploy? Number three, how, if any, does the nature form of state response assess the threat contribute away government number four what is the extent IT political economy that underpins support and creates opportunities to call of access number five right when the EU tells that there's a threat ISGS. This one. Or that as the state, we have the capacity to determine. These questions share, I argue, narrative. Right. I also argue. But if we take the example of two, Benin, Southern Burkina Faso, the argument was made. At first glance, the situation is partly due to this relatively narrow northern are uh, easier. I argue that such assessments can overlook the professional and tactical calculation. Are talking about ISGS. Yeah. It is not the same thing. The capacity to demonstrate competence. In an earlier article with my colleague, challenged the manner in which national relations. Determine the basis upon which security discourse Africa are constructed. And we argue that we needed to deconstruct the way in which patient particular security for not objects of security. These imbalances in knowledge generation delegates our own experience politics. Our argument is that there are particular approaches that trivializes African experiences and knowledge, thus overlooks 
Africa in the policies. Central to the process of relegation, methodological approach, just other people's as a unit. This relegation, I argue, is spent in the EU and argument. And then the destabilization of the Sahel constitutes a direct threat to the European not only in terms of security and terrorism, any other areas that the African such construction of the terrorist threat, I argue, the expansion have contributed to and resulted in ending and accept almost no the end result, presenting such stylized facts, that shows that beyond their particular heavy human capital extension terrorist attack, is of this operating method, Hamas. That we need to operate empirical experiences as they are manifest. Ordering the empirical base for theorizing and analyzing these things. National assumption. If member states is That was in February 2013, the U.S.'s political declaration. Counter-terrorism strategy. Not to prevent and eradicate terrorism. Shared norms, shared values. And the title for the foundation based on norms. A sort to criminalize offenses such as incitement to error, other aspects included ECOWAS terrorism, the twenty thirteen document was never implemented. Apparent lack of Enthusiasm as the latest action raises questions. A new plan has been brought into place, the 2020 to 20 action plan adopted in 2018 budget of eight priority areas that seek to coordination. However, this has become the eight priority areas. Pache argues that part of the weakness of the strategy order management, intelligence, training, whilst you use prioritizing them to that extent that allows for terrorism to thrive on a terror. Demonstrate house too many. Capacity of ad hoc security. It's a 
some total of this computer. Um, increasingly in the house. Yeah, so if people has, has a bit of the AU, not particularly, what are we doing for ourselves? Because everyone seems to come here and comes bearing gifts, meaning that there's a certain extent. Some people, it's beer. So similar to West African countries, Ghana has enacted a panoply of frameworks to respond to the manner in which we have food. We have a national framework for preventing and countering extremism. National Border Security Fusion Center. Its focus is to increase collaboration and sharing of this fund that provides a viable avenue for research. Then we have a new Security and Intelligence Services Act from 2020, which has made provision for a new ministerial coordinating. Collected a determination, I would argue, in the performance of the National Security Council of a national security strategy. The national security strategy document implies first the threats, nature of the structure and reporting, coordination guidelines to bring clarity, and above all, seeks to reverse the historical misuse in national security as an all-encompassing term. Ghana's national security strategy document finalized in 2020 under the heading your so that gives us some but not only that we have an anti-terrorism act of eight act 10 organized crime these include missions for addressing the financing the and the supporting terrorist activities and provides critical platforms for response. It also talks about the challenges to ECQ stability. Okay, so what does the story tell us? First, and then more. Gathering of data where they are operating, kinds of opportunities, psychological makeup, and where and how it I'll leave some pictures. A swap in the eight years. Black tag army addressed armed force probably. ISGS is still a rag tag army. Kids on motorbikes are capable of challenging statutory. And more often than so, Chair, the quality of governance also does the way in that we fight. So, two minutes whilst I we cannot that terror brings fear. But there are other challenges. I think we should drive the agenda. And as the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences, members of an epistemic community have that unique power, the power to ask counterfactual questions, generate new knowledge that locates our lived experiences 
at the center of our work. Scrutinize official action. To take the rights and the Yeah, the key stakeholder. Sure. That counter-terrorism efforts are effective. That just mental values. We must harness this power to the creating international domestic laws, affecting human rights and freedom. But to investigate cases where rights are the public understanding. Intelligence services strike the right balance between essential, I argue, to recognize countering terror or violence. I follow thing. Don't touch. How to bring in the social economic that will engage in civil society paramount in the heaven. But our collective efforts must also encompass not only the domestic efforts, but also. I argue that together we can build a formidable front against the root causes. Protecting not only Ghana, but certainly our contiguous states and much further. But we must also predicate work. President of the distinguished members of former teacher and co-panelist, Professor Kusieni, I also acknowledge my former boss. Justice Professor Ahmed Zabu. Thank you for coming. Permit me to thank the organizers of the Founders Day Lecture Series for the kind invitation to share some thoughts on new spheres of influence, Africa's peace, security, key pathways for Ghana's engagement. I am truly humbled. The paper chair is divided into four main pieces. An introduction which traces the trajectory of the concept of spheres of influence in Africa, starting from the Cold War to the immediate Cold War period, Africa's continued strategic relevance, new types of influence on Africa, and finally, key pathways for Ghana. A trajectory of the spheres of influence in Africa from the Cold War, immediate Cold War, about the 1990s, early 1990s, 
is critical to our ability to interrogate the new spheres of influence, Africa's peace. This is because those earlier practices have had significant influence over Africa's vulnerability. In some instances, they deepened existing fault lines, while in others, they actually led to the creation of new criteria for inclusion. Considering the legacy of spheres of influence over Africa's peace and landscape, therefore essential to appreciating the issues that should inform our engagement with actors seeking influence in Africa. A key part ways Ghana must consider in its engagement. Ladies and gentlemen, traditionally, the concept of spheres of influence referred to the assertion of influence by a powerful state over a smaller or weaker state. Whilst the de jure level of influence did not include direct control over the day-to-day -day administration of the country, as otherwise was the case of colonialism, it was nonetheless sufficiently significant to elicit deference from the state in relation to its ideological orientation, allies it kept, and its economic development. Even so, the practice in some countries differed from the law, as politically supported and sometimes even appointed appendages ensured the footprints of the in daily administration. The idea of spheres of influence has undergone several iterations by the year. From the Monroe Doctrine of 1823, which established American dominance over the Americas, to the post-World War II era, when states actually used force to assert their influence, as the United States did in the Dominican Republic, and the then USSR in Czechoslovakia, and the Cold War era of 1947 to 1990, when the world was essentially split in two by the two superpowers who, among other things, supported the nations within their spheres of influence by its proxy war. Fortunately, a number of these countries happened to be of During this period, the African continent was carved into two main blocks, capitalism and socialism administered by four main countries. United States of America, Great Britain and France on the one hand, and the USSR on the other. The USA and Great Britain shared similar spheres. France maintained a monopoly over most of its former colonies, whilst the USSR's influence, mainly on countries it had supported to wage liberation wars, such as Algeria, Angola, Equatorial Guinea, and Guinea-Bissau, and those whose troubled governments it had supported, such as Egypt. Whilst countries like Ghana indeed played the non-aligned card, it was nonetheless easy to identify the country's ideological leaning under various A significant characteristic of the concept of spheres of influence is that the influencing states possesses capabilities deemed critical to the survival of the deferring. These capabilities include military and economic power and the ability to sway international opinion in their direction, especially on multilateral parts. Countries within an influencer sphere benefited from these capabilities, whilst those outside the sphere could be punished by the influencer with state. The influencer provided military aid, security guarantees, and development assistance to states within its sphere that played by the rules. Whilst those outside the sphere who desired to be part of the sphere were punished with support to those seeking to undermine their security. The end of the Cold War, however, reduced the continent's strategic significance for ideological. The victory of capitalism over socialism meant that there was no longer an ideological contest 
for which full waste way. Right? The quest for stable markets and a guarantee of investment became critical consideration. A change in consideration led to a paradigmatic shift by influencing powers for durable governance systems that offered continuity. As a result, while influencing states still retained an interest in their areas of influence, few conditions were. For the most part, influencer states that had underwritten the security of teams in exchange for loyalty now demanded good governance, democracy, and free markets. These demands coincided with three main developments. One was the increased access to weapons often by state-supported non-state actors. Two was accelerated technological advancements, particularly in communications and mobility that enabled faster mobilization. And three, the emerging cracks in the multilateral system as demonstrated by the UN's inability to several African countries, either because of the delayed or the inadequate response which the organizations, um, sorry, either because of the delayed or the inadequate response, which in the organization's defense was more a function of its legislation. The reputational damage to the organization's ability to maintain international peace and security, particularly on the African continent. And here I'd like to refer you to the instances of Rwanda the cases of Liberia and Sierra Leone signaled to African leaders that they could only rely on their own capability. That's the right. A footnote worthy of highlighting, Chair, is that in the Cold War period, the articulated needs of the influenced states were often the needs of the rather than the state. While the interest of the influencer states had changed, those of the influencing state, epitomized by the regime, had not. Therefore, the regimes of influenced states began to respond positively to the advances of new allies. These new allies offered comparable security guarantee without the encumbrances of good governance and requirements of other things associated with democracy. Consequently, even though the nature scale and magnitude of the proxy wars were nothing like what was witnessed during the Cold War. There was still jostling for influence as friends became enemies, supporting others with the promise of furthering their new interests. The dynamics of influence started to shift again with the changes in governance systems. The end of the 1990s saw increasing multilateral cooperation and a much more concerted effort. Nonetheless, that great power rivalry did not complete it. Instead, there was a lot of accommodation as states worked together to address the global challenges of disease, climate insecurity, and transnational ice crime. 1994, the concept of human security was introduced into international and national discourse, having been made prominent through the 1994 United Nations Development Programs Human Development. Human security crystallized the various efforts at broadening the post-Cold War, setting out seven main dimensions essential to the well-being of India, entry to the concept economic security, Food security, health security, environmental security, personal security, community security, and political security became legitimate themes, a holistic continent. The continent, significant political transformations were taking. Internal demands for democracy aligned with the new conditions by Western allies which had resorted to the use of carrots and sticks for governance reform. A record number of African countries underwent democratic transformation and either established or strengthened institutional governance and the promotion of human rights and fundamental. 
the opening of markets and investments in technology resulted in more accessibility, technological communication, telephones, or here mobile telephones, and internet access. This facilitated access to information and the mobilization of political pressure groups that demanded accountability or significant. States began to realign their concept of security. Some states went as far as revising their national security policy, while some signaled changes in practice. It had become evident at this point that the wind of change was blowing. State survival depended on demonstrating that citizen interest um, So state security, translated as regime security, began to chip away, building. Development and growth were now the top needs, and there were no. Except for Francophone Africa, where France continued to play an open role of an influencer, the recognition of spheres of influence of becoming much more team. But perhaps spheres of influence not in the team. Still, since there is a correlation between the ability of the influencer to use its capability assess the influence to meet its needs. The primary question was the extent to which the traditional states that exercised influence were able to meet the contemporary needs. Many African countries accepted assistance from elsewhere, opening up to countries outside the list of traditional allies. Yeah? A point worthy of note that it is now quite challenging to speak of a sphere of influence what is now observable is the multiplicity of actors that exercise influence in varied aspects of the life of a The terrorist attacks of September 9, 2001 significantly impacted interstate relations. Although American interests in Africa, Nairobi and Tanzania to be specific, had been attacked in 1990. The attacks on the U.S. soil revealed a critical need for the reconceptualization of state. That's the measures needed for it. The interrelated nature of security threats, the need for allies to support the so-called war on terror, and the efforts to insulate the American state and its interest in Africa resulted in new considerations. While the conditions for Democratization and good governance generally remain. The USA, in particular, courted countries it deemed critical to guaranteeing its security and almost ignored their less than optimal human rights. So, the question that we need to try to answer now is what accounts for Africa's continued strategic development? Africa's strategic natural resource endowments include Sultan in the Democratic Republic of Congo, uranium in Namibia and Niger, oil and gas in several African countries, lithium and the traditional resources of gold, diamonds, bauxite, and iron ore. These resources, which are required for industrial and technological purposes, continue to place Africa in a strategic Africa also offered. The prospect of better integrated markets in Africa through the progressive reduction and eventual elimination of tariffs, which is promised by the African continental free trade area, will benefit not only African countries, but also the African. Second, Africa's fast increasing youth, which is much more mobile networked and better educated is also one of its strategic Africa's population grew from 810 million in 2000, 1.37 billion by 2021. And according to the United Nations, Africa's populations would double to 2.5 billion by 2050, 4.3 billion by 2020. 
Africa's youthful population offers a significant proportion of the global labor force both today and in the future. As a bloc, the continent retains strategic significance in the international system, particularly in the United Nations. Africa's collective voice can sway opinion and affect decision making. And a recent manifestation of such collective strength was seen in the voting patterns of African countries on the UN's resolution um, on uh, Russia and Ukraine. So when the first resolution was proposed, 17 African countries abstained and eight were absent during the vote on the resolution on aggression against Ukraine, centered in March 2020. The reasons assigned by those who made statements before or after the vote were that the pen holders largely ignored. Following further consultation and accommodation, the voting patterns among the African member states changed on the resolution principles of the Charter of the United Nations, underlying a comprehensive, just and lasting peace. During this vote, ladies and gentlemen, 30 African states, three more states than the previous one, voted in favor, 15, less than two from the first one abstained, and six, again, less than two from the first resolution. The behavior of the United States and its NATO allies in the form of visits and phone calls to African capitals before the vote and the response after voting were clear signals that Africa was still. Fortunately, apart from the positive attributes, insecurity in Africa's peace and security landscape also offers a silver lining for its It is rather unfortunate that Africa continues to host a significant number of armed conflicts and continues to witness the proliferation of armed groups, as Dr. Tenney has just said. Africa is not just grappling with the challenges of traditional. Since the turn of the millennium, the international security environment has been characterized by significant challenges, such as violent extremism and terrorism. Whilst the prosecution of armed conflict and the events associated with complex security challenges may manifest locally, they are influenced and influence global. For example, while Africans have traveled out of the continent to fight in places like Syria, either as part of organized mercenary groups or to join extremist groups like the Islamic State, there are also increasing numbers of foreign fighters on the continent. Some of these operate as lone wolves, some as part of groups, and others, as noted recently, as part of state sponsored. The spread of violent extremism, particularly from the Sahel region to the coastal states of West Africa and in Southern Africa, creates significant challenges that should make every country concerned interested in putting measures. Yes. Put this in perspective, whilst there were no recorded instances of and jihadi attacks in Africa in 2000, the Armed Conflict Location and Event Data Project, ACLEG, recorded 288 violent jihadi events in 2000. By 2020, ACLEG reported almost 5,000 events in the Sahel, the Lake Chad Basin, Somalia, North Africa, and Northern these incidents have implications on the global security landscape, raising the interests of governments who So what do we see now? We see new types of influence on Africa. For many years since the end of the Cold War, external power brokering in Africa revolved around the US, Russia, the European Union, and China. Within this context, engaging external actors and predicting trends relating to Africa's geopolitics was reasonably straightforward. In the last decade, however, there have been emerging nodes of variable interest in Africa's geopolitics. While the traditional actors above still maintain relationships that contribute to socioeconomic and security benefits, 
some relatively new actors play such significant roles in state that they too can exercise. These new actors include Brazil, Russia with a recalibrated influence, India, China, and Turkey. In addition, there are also the Gulf states, Qatar, the UAE, and Saudi Arabia. These new actors have provided varied types of support and carved out niches in where they exert some influence. Although the USA continues to provide traditional development assistance as part of its efforts at carrying influence, it has demonstrated increased interest in counterterrorism. This end, there has been an increase in the provision of women's capability to establish initiatives to help counterterrorism areas with high terrorist risk. So in the East Africa region, for example, where Al Shabaab is considered a significant threat to the United States, considerable resources have been allocated to the Partnership for Regional East Africa Counter. And this assistance has been to countries like Djibouti, Kenya, Mozambique, Somalia, Tanzania, Uganda, Burundi, Comoros, Ethiopia, Rwanda, Seychelles, South Sudan, and Sudan. Clearly, from this list, I believe that we can all interrogate the democratic and governance credentials. Similar support is provided to Algeria, Burkina Faso, Cameroon, Chad, Libya, Mali, Albania, Morocco, Chad, Nigeria, Senegal, and Tunisia, which are countries with contiguous borders that have similar challenges. China's strategy of gaining influence primarily over access to resources in Africa has been through different cooperative partnership agreements with different countries to provide development assistance support to poverty reduction in Egypt. Although framed primarily as development cooperation, China also provides military assistance to address security needs in countries with such cooperative partners. Exchange. China, like the others, has access to the market of its partners and can create investment opportunities. A significant difference between China and the countries that exercised influence in Africa during the Cold War and the immediate post-Cold War period, that unlike the others, China does not set governance-related preconditions. Mutual political trust is one of the pillars of China's partnership with African countries. So China's Belt and Road Initiative, massive initiative to finance and construct infrastructure projects and other commercial enterprises across perhaps 87 countries, is one of the significant frameworks for China's engagement in South Africa. This initiative facilitates connectivity, offers employment creation opportunities, and contributes to infrastructural development. It all issues that Africans have to address. Turkey, Qatar, UAE, Saudi Arabia, as mentioned earlier, a seemingly recalibrated Russian influence on the continent also exert levels of influence. These new actors and their engagement in Africa's peace and landscape are primarily visible in While the popular narrative has evolved around the acquisition of military bases in the region, some of these countries have also played direct roles in influencing the region that peace and peace. So in Sudan, for instance, Qatar was instrumental in brokering the Doha document for peace, which provided a framework for a more recently. Following the April 15, 2023 outbreak of violence in Sudan, the United States has been working with Saudi Arabia, not the African Union, to mediate between the two parties. Meeting is not happening in Africa. Saudi Arabia is holding. Somalia, the support provided by Turkey contributed to developing the capacities of security and the federal member states. However, 
the geopolitical rivalry of these two also sometimes negatively impacted their role. Malia, Gulf state rivalry undermined efforts to address the conflict political dimension between the federal government and the federal government. And so it is observable that there are efforts by these new actors also increase their areas of influence as seen in the role being played in Turkey and Qatar in addressing crisis at Okay. I will now turn my attention, based on the trajectory that I have tried to plot, the key pathways that Ghana must consider. As you may have noticed, I have deliberately steered away from using the exercise of influence, choosing instead to use the exercise of influence. This decision is informed by the fact that in contemporary times, no single state can claim a sphere of influence. It's true. Whilst there is no doubt that external states continue to exert influence over certain aspects of decision making by some African states, no state can claim to singularly apply a predominant, I quote, a predominant influence which limits the independence or freedom of action of states in its. This is the quote. Right. There are multiple actors with strategic interests and a quest to be a prepared ally. Ghana has strategic relevance to most of these actors interested in its natural resources, its strategic location, relatively conducive business environment, reputation among them. Ghana's pathways for engagement, therefore, focus on substantive issues in their own right, in that they yield desired results that contribute to the country's socioeconomic development, but are also interlinked with the country's program. Various actors seeking to gain favor with Ghana offer a many of them. Therefore, up to us to identify and decide who to work with and in what domains to leverage the comparative advantage of this actor whilst mitigating the that come. With. I will therefore propose five main strategic pathways for Ghana's engagement. The first is for us to develop a clear strategy. Recognizing areas of comparative advantage and developing a clear strategy of engagement are first priority. With a well articulated engagement strategy formed by lessons from the past, Ghana will be able to leverage its strengths optimally. Such a strategy must be informed by the profile of the countries interested in Ghana, their strategic interests, the considerations that inform their decision making, the possible negative fallout of any relation, so that mitigation strategies may be developed to minimize the negative consequences. The strategy must also be well disseminated to relevant stakeholders to ensure that the tenants are well known and understood can be applied when necessary. A challenge that we must avoid is developing what could otherwise be a useful that is only known to by a few people. Question. The second strategic pathway, Chair, is nurturing and guarding our reputational impact. Ghana's reputation is one of its most significant strategic a number and status of leaders from all over the world that have visited Ghana indicates that Ghana's friendship, opinion, and support on the international plane is not valued. This reputational value is derived from the country's democratic and good governance. Anchored on our articulated values of respect for human rights and freedom, nationalism, and the rule of law. These values must be seen as strategic and must be protected by God. Ghana has been in the news, both nationally and internationally, in the last decade for very concerning things. Alleged military and police brutalities, accusations of judicial manipulation, and corruption. These stories harm us as a nation and incrementally affect our strategic. 
Whilst the state cannot always control how a few individuals behave and the narrative that ensues across, states must have a proactive mechanism that addresses such infractions when they communicate the actions taken both to the local. Third consideration that should guide Ghana's engagement is the development of its human needs. Ghana should focus on developing its human resource, particularly in the world is said to be witnessing the fourth industrial revolution. Africa has been identified as one of the leading. As mentioned earlier, we are the youngest continent. The International Labour Organization has suggested that, and I quote, the biggest business opportunity in the coming decade will be created by Africans who start businesses, generate jobs and wealth, and capture growth opportunities. African youth are, quote, 1.6 times more likely to become entrepreneurs and more likely to maintain a solid presence in the service sectors such as heritage, culture, music, design, and digital innovation. In addition, Africa is also known to have a high rate of female entrepreneurs, with women making up 58% of Africa's entrepreneurs. Ghana must position itself to harness the opportunities inherent in the digital revolution, mainly through support to young entrepreneurs using technology and digitization, making value change. Is strategic engagement with those seeking influence. Considerations of these two. Another area still on developing Ghana's human resource is through support to startups. Africa's startups are attracting significant funding. Despite the economic deterioration occasioned by the COVID-19 disease, African startups attracted $5.2 billion in funding in 2021 and 4.8 billion in 2020. A slight dip can be attributed to the overall global economic trend down. However, the otherwise steady progression in venture capital financing signals the viability and potential of startups on the continent. Ghana is already tapping into this, listed as six of the top 10 African countries with the best startup ecosystem as at 2020. Optimize the potential therein, there is the need once again for a strategy that provides multi-level support based on competences that help to develop and incubate such startups at different. Agriculture is the next consideration that should guide Ghana's engagement. Agriculture has been the backbone of Ghana's economy, employing millions of its population. Whilst this is acknowledged and successive governments have supported the development of the agricultural sector of Ghana, a lot more still needs to be done. The efforts to double agricultural inputs such as crops, livestock, and fisheries by 2025 are commendable. However, progress could be slow with only about 1% of agricultural GDP being invested in agricultural research with the combination of its vast arable land and labor force, agriculture could become the driving force for economic development if it receives the requisite attention in terms of funding. Yet, available data from the Biennial Review Report, the African Union Commission on the Implementation of the Malabo Declaration, Accelerated Agricultural Growth and Transportation for Third Prosperity and Improved Livelihood, shows that no country was on track to meet the commitment of investing 10% of public annual expenditure. Ghana, like the others, is not funding the minimum 10%. There is no gain saying that Ghana needs to invest. Agriculture is the backbone of Ghana's economy, it must be protected from the existential threat of climate variability, particularly of the youth, based on its low risk. Ghana must invest in climate resilient infrastructure and measures to protect investment. The promise of agriculture is not just through farming, but also through the agri food value chain, which can also be.
share the faith consideration that Ghana should have in its engagement with its external actors, a focus on climate resilience. The evidence of the effects of climate change on Africa's peace and security landscape is quite concerned. Ghana needs to take a cue from the experiences of other countries on the continent, develop resilience and human-induced degradation of the environment, as we are witnessing with the unsustainable mining practices of the Lanclay operators, exacerbates the effects of climate change on the environment. Yet, we all know that climate change poses an existential threat to us, as treated. There are small and big steps that can be taken. First, we can commit to implementing the National Climate Change Plan. You to understand that doing this is not has to be a must. And so, Chair, in conclusion, I'd like to say that there is a mutually reinforcing relationship between a country's socioeconomic development and its peace. A theory of change underpinning the pathways for engagement, which I have laid out, is that if Ghana pays attention to the areas suggested, it could engage its external actors interested in carrying its favor or support in these domains. And by doing so, it will in turn strengthen its efforts to guarantee. Every effort must be made to ensure that we retain what makes us strategic whilst we welcome. I think. Please give them a round of applause. Okay, for the past one and a half hours, we have been listening. That question. Our time, questions, five questions. So please identify yourself, your name, where you are, but be straightforward. Go straight to the point, the question. Okay. Where we frame the issues of security. First, it's the fortunate matter. Uh, I thought this was going to be an issue that was going to be dealt with. Government concern, see, they seem to have falling off the radar. I've always wondered such a thing had happened in an African country. Happened to that country. Second one, creation of capital related to that and attacks Trump Ishiari and I've wondered personality was African leader said it sort of changed my thinking regarding the issues for these countries
The second one is the security at the basic level. Um, at least if I'm speaking from the perspective of Ghana, there are very large gatherings identify for of these things. The first, second is funeral, third is religious gatherings and the car rallies. Continue to talk about security in this country, but it's very difficult to see what consistent strategies. I'm speaking because of second, what consistent strategies we have dealing with these regular gatherings. My name is Isaac, and I think I have a short question for you. Is this emerging thing in a political landscape of politicians creating an unexisting problem, and uh, unexisting and needless action, turning uh, intolerance? This is this a concern for us to worry about change security, even with violent extremism and then tourism. And also, how do we deal with it collectively? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Liz, this question is uh, posed to uh, <coughs> Professor Enin. And I had him list some of the um, initiatives that Ghana had adopted to counter terrorism. But I want to ask him to assess Ghana's preparedness towards counter um, ter terrorism or any terrorist action. Looking at our institutional framework, does it think that the current institutional framework that we have can be able to um, oppose or destroy any existential threat to our security? Thank you. Thank you. I'm Stephen Kwekukwansa from Odogono SHS. Please, my dear sister talks about climate change. There is one thing that I've been observing, I'm engineering personally, is that the grass structures that are coming up, when it's in the afternoon and the sun hits the glasses, it's so hot when it hits your skin. So if we can do something about it, our situation here is different from the West. So if architectural engineers would be tackled to attend to that situation. Thank you very much. Let's ask the speakers to respond. Dr. Dagwa first. <laughs> I will attempt to uh, respond to the first question on what is happening in the West. And I think when I traced the trajectory, one of the points I was trying to make was the change to nature of people. So whilst at some point good governance, human rights credentials were paramount, they are no longer as paramount as they used to be in because what is now deemed as critical threats are the threat of terrorism and violent extremism. And so the countries that you are expecting or you were expecting to respond to the Jamal Khashoggi day, weighed what their interests were and decided that staying a little, keeping quiet, 
was much more in their favor because they needed Turkey as an ally in the fight again. Um, Turkey is doing a lot when it comes to that area with Syria and all that is happening in there. And so it serves as a buffer and it serves as the eyes of those countries that you are hoping actually respond. I, I will not mention names, but I would like to inform you that a similar situation happened um, on the African continent, where there was uh, alleged state-sponsored murder in a particular country, and they did not say anything. So it's now more of what is our interest and who helps to guarantee that interest wherever in the world. If it happened in a country with little strategic significance, they have had a lot of money. It's also the case that right now, countries like the United States are busily cozying up to Saudi Arabia for many reasons. And because of that, even the criticism against um, Mohammed bin Salman was quite tamed. What one would have. Um, on the issue of President Trump, I think that what has been the saving grace of the United States is its institution. Because with everything that went on at Capitol Hill then, if America did not have strong institutions, I don't think that we would have had the America we still have. Of course, his behavior while in office and out of office has also dented the image of the United States as leader of the free world um, in effect. And I think that it's been dated in many ways. Well, so let me mention some names. There are some bad guys in town. Al Sisi in Egypt. I mean, he's a bad guy. There's no doubt about it. And if Al Sisi had been in Togo, uh, Ambia, Benin, Americans have dealt with it. Look, like so, our friends care whether we jump into this. As far as we play the game, so true. Yes, there has been a coup in Guinea. But nobody talks about the coup in Guinea. Guinea has about 47 of the world's iron ore. When the Guinea coup took place, you know, Mr. Sarkozy, that French, the prime minister, who has a criminal case for bribery, and a leg chain that the judges have put on, when our judges will be putting about that on people's minds. Blue. To Conakry, Mr. Tony Blair, the man who brags about whatever it is, also flew to. Who are those who are begging the president of Guinea? Teki is there. Tal is there. Oleg Eripeska has been banned elsewhere in Guinea. It's schmoozing the French. So I'll leave that one, the politics, to. Number two is Niger. When the coup happened, our leaders demonstrated that the documents upon which they were threatening to intervene, that they hadn't read it. The first threat, even the president of the seven days to hand over, that they were going to use the, the African, the ECOWAS standby force. The ECOWAS standby force can only be initiated after 90 days. Uh, Dr. Dakwe. Uh, it is not used for making business. But the Americans have been the biggest drone base on this continent, in Niger, decided to double cross their cousins, the French and cut a deal government. Now, what are the implications for democracy? It means 
And here, this is free consultancy for our leaders. If you don't play your cards well and govern your people well, and somebody use the proper narrative, your friends in the West will join the man who has taken the gate. Old Guinea, Egypt, and Niger send clear signals that those who preach the movement don't care. Let me not speak. If they are national interest. And therefore, Mr. Biden, an old man, what do you want? He went and gave shake hands. That is the epitome of hypocrisy. Whether you bump or you shake, you've cut the man's skin. I mean, so who are you fooling? Okay, now. The January invasion, what would they have discovered? You saw people wearing some uh, boot arms. I said, our people with yes and arrows, you know, charging to kill democracy. Words and language. Markets, funerals, religious, blah, blah, political rallies. That's about the political rallies, the least spoken about it, the better. Because come June 2024, vigilantes will rear their nasty. And um, Ben Cass, you do also something. As for the religious people, one disaster, and they will see excess of visions of God telling them that ABC. But immediately we threaten to beat them, they will, show another, they will see another vision. And we have seen it before. As for the markets, it is a miracle that nothing happens. But it is also because there's something that we take for granted. I don't know how many people here maybe are from national intelligence. This is a country that has intelligence agents across the world. Probably the most experienced embedded set of intelligence agents in the other country. The Indians came here to learn From in Krumer's time, multiple national security agents brought into the prison. At 10.30, intelligence and security act, as the national security spread, creates a basis of an intelligence network that is more responsible. So, violence, death, shootings, Markets, funerals, religious, maybe one crazy opportunistic, but a consistent, organized. Sometimes I'm actually very shocked when people expose me. Country is good. Though. I ought to have been in prison. So I, I don't lose sleep. I'm not afraid when I go to them. I don't have enough lost to go especially when I wear the single one because I went for a funeral and somebody said oh okay see are you still in this same black cloth so it is the quality of the cloth that they want and you see as for the churches the least the better it's the vigilantes that worry at 999 has not been the hard work that was done under the, the short has been torn apart. Right now, it is not party A and party B that poses the problem. The allure of getting access to state, just the smell is so nice that even when parties are meeting, Charles will have to go with their bodyguards. And that is where the danger is. 
There were things to happen anytime there's a change of government. It will be nasty. Extremely nasty. Toilet attendance to urinary attendance to uh, leaders of pocket groups. It will be nasty and I think we Any more thanks? Okay. Thank you very much. My name is Atuku Ifio. Um, I'd like to say thank you to that um, wonderful patient. Um, Dr. Dakwa in her presentation talked about the need for a strategy. And in um, Professor Enning's uh, response to the first round of questions, touched on something that I thought was critical. Provini talked about how the Americans cut a deal with the Nigerians, maintained their drone base, albeit perhaps shifted a bit to Agadez. Now, this was the same Americans that Ghana appeared to have been reporting our northern neighbors to. And so here is the deal. Now, there's a group of forces in the Lake Chad Basin called the Multinational Joint Tax Force. These are the forces that are combating terrorism in that region. Now, as a result of the coup d'etat in Niger, Niger has pulled out of the MNJTF and by so doing has blocked some of the active supply routes. This is open knowledge. And so by so doing, it's become a bit more difficult to combat terrorism in that broader region. And yet we find ourselves reporting our northern neighbors regarding the rules of intelligence called collaboration with the Americans. Do we have a strategy, Dr. Dapa? Now, the second question has to do with um, something, say something, Prof. Senning. Now, we have a number of people here. And Prof, you know that one of the things we see, or what we see is what we are trained to see. Now, with our, excuse me to say, TikTok generation, we all do TikTok every now and then. How do we train them to see what they are expected to see? and by so doing, contributes to our engagement with um, you know, the counter-terrorism initiative. Thank you very much. My name is Anne Pamlori Shakisi, Accra College of Education. When Dr. Linda was speaking on the strategic pathways, she made mention of development of our human resources, particularly the youth. Can you please elaborate on the how? I'm terribly sorry. I mean, the first round, there were a couple of uh, questions. So let me raise through it. Religious intolerance. I mean, that is a deliberate response. An emotion. And I think anyone who seeks to really wants kind of, well, There are such high strength and hard work that people are doing and we can remember the case where in your high school you have wearing girls. And it left Rounds of mediation and religious leaders dampen. I think 
those who want to come. Um, yes, the initiatives are there. Um, need to keep training trade. I have never believed when people say, If you go to the, I don't know how many of you have been to the or how many VAs you have seen. So, and the terrorists know this. If you go to the political economy, criminal enterprises that struggled, have not been. Hundreds of million, about 150 million every year. Fertilizer. So there's an economy that we're we to be able to control, have to fund every single counter Accra dollar power. How many have been there before? How many have heard of Accra dollar? Accra dollar power, known by its traditional name, Asindi around the Boli area. 5,000 people have occupied this place, mining gold, have their own rules and regulations. I mean, nobody knows where the gold goes, but it has attracted a host of people like Cote d'Ivoire, Burkina Faso, Mali, Niger, and Chad. Now, it raises a fundamental question as to why a sovereign state Driven or governed by the ruler as a territory. That is one accent. So that raises questions about preparedness. So the institutional framework. Now, now you cannot run an anti terror counter-terrorism campaign with a stolen story. When you plagiarize the fundamental thing as the slogan that a nation must use to counter terror. See something says, so what are you supposed to And what are you and to who and how. So we have seen posters in town, huge billboards, where somebody is dressed like a supposed terrorist. A grenade is showing, think he has a gun, and you wonder what stupidity. No terrorist or even vigilante show you his gun. So basically those who have crafted that campaign I brought a lot of energy and thought into it. Now, when the campaign was launched, it was more dancing the usual thing. You know, we came, did the picture, picture, you know, shook all parts of our body off, we went. So, my dear friend, Philip, just in the several years ago, would have characterized you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I am saying this because in the African Union, we, when I was there, we did three things. We established a model counterterrorism law. Philip's beard, several countries would have classified him as such. We also did an institutional framework where member states then be given basic things. We don't even want to buy a computer. If we go to New York, we like the DSA, we sign on to the instruments, and you go to most countries. So we used to you know, provide these things for you. If you take the whole of this country, and with the 5,300 attacks and 16,000 injuries, and 5,000 deaths. And count on this finger how many terrorists. Listen, 
First, because we don't know how to do the event. Because by the time the evidence is brought before judge goes through the system to the Supreme Because there's nothing we like more than something happens and we all trample on the evidence. So on this continent, every single so-called terrorist who is in prison because we have flouted the law. Okay? So there's a big problem, a mega J5 Sahel, Mali out. Multinational Joint Task Force, uh, Niger, a country like Chad. Both ECOWAS and African Union are inconsistent in applying their own normative frameworks. We are claiming that Mali, Burkina Faso have made the coup, blah, blah, blah. But the kid in, in Jamina, his father was murdered. He just jumped into the seat, promised to make an election. He's forgotten about it. Dealt with a couple of his opponents. And we are sitting on the sidelines clapping. And when Niger happened, the same AU said, go to Niger, tell them. You, you've taken over the seat from your father. I'm sitting on it tight. You, you, what is this glue? Super glue. To sit on the chair where well. And you are coming to tell me to hand it. It doesn't work. Those who advise them, please have a little bit of backbone and spine. Two cases. When Niger happened, and we met in extraordinary session. In what to have to do to that? We don't have the capacity because he had just signed everyone above the rank of two. So going to lead your forces to Niger. Second. That when our multilateral institutions that summit in have the money, we will go in two months after. Made threats. Multilateral institutions are useful only when there's direct correlation. All things. As for the use, in 1951, when we got self rule, Ghana's population was almost the same as Denmark. 60-something years later, Denmark is just about 6.2, and we are going to 34 million. So the question is, who are we, and why do we have we at this exponential? Because to come back to the church market and funeral, when you go to my part of Ghana, 12, 13, 14 year old, almost no waste. Proud to be carrying a baby. She herself is so emaciated that you wonder where's the breast milk? But nobody in the town is there. Go back to school. And we help you. So the youth bulge, we are going to continue to try to cross the Sahara to Europe. A lot of us is going to die. And Joseph Borrell, that I cited, has already cautioned us. And we don't want your forest to come across the our garden. Nobody wants us. So the best option is finish school. Okay? 
Because immediately you get a baby now, your value comes down by 90%. Thank you very much. Try to respond to a few questions. So there is absolutely no have a strike. And there is a difference between what politics and what technocrats. After the pronouncements by the president um, during the summit, our intelligence officers had the duty, and our foreign service officers had the duty of doing the job. As you very well know, Dr. Atiku, had to send delegations to Burkina Faso, basically re engage to assure our northern neighbors of our our continued cooperation and the need to hold on to trust, even if that's technical. So yes, we do have a strategy, but sometimes our politicians, I think that in that particular case, um, Off has uh, answered a number of the questions. I think preventing that part of the challenge that we are confronted with when it comes to our multilateral institutions is that our multilateral institutions have not moved with the times. And that is part of the reason why we are found one. Because at the time of the coup, when Sudan had the coup, and this is very interesting, when Sudan had the coup, I still remember the PSC meeting, one of the longest meetings of the coup. And one of the things that the Nigerian permanent representative said at the meeting was that I am from Nigeria. If it looks like a coup, then it is a coup. When the Chad coup happened, that permanent representative was a for Peter. Of course, he wanted the African Union to apply sanctions. But at this time, and if he said that, if it, it smells like a coup, it must be a coup, that would have been directions from his capital. Now he is commissioner and somebody else is sitting in the seat of um, permanent rent. And Nigeria was very key in not in fighting against sanctions being had because Chad is a critical ally in the fight against Africa. And so increasingly what is becoming evident is that the normative frameworks that were negotiated at a time when we didn't have these security challenges may have to be looked at. And in fact, currently, a major challenge that the African Union is confronted with is how its political responses and constitutional changes in government is affecting the security mechanism. Because now the European Union says we are withdrawing support because you are a sanctioned coup. And yet, what is happening in the lecture, I mean, this is what terrorists want, that there are no capabilities so that they can. And so I think this is something that we need to take another look at. Should we review the normative frameworks or realign them to our current security um, challenge? Um, Ma'am, in terms of the question on how do we develop the capacities of we have a number of strategies. I think a major challenge we have on this point, Ghana, is our inability to strategies. So we do have strategies to develop the capacity. That is what we do. But at a personal level, there are things that young people can do. Instead of spending all of our time on Facebook, because we have smartphones. How many of you have smartphones? All of you do. Instead of spending all of your time on smartphones, there are so many videos on YouTube that will teach you a skill or two. So yes, it is good to connect with friends on Facebook, but what communities are you connecting with? Is it the community of tech or is it the community of gossip? 
And it's entirely up to you. The state has a responsibility, but young people also have a responsibility. A study that was done a few years ago, for example, showed that whilst young, young men went on the internet looking for jobs, young women tended to go on the internet. I think that those who are here would not become like those um, young. Um, Singapore does not have natural resources, but it is one of the richest countries. Why? Because it has a highly capable human. There is nothing wrong with being able to support the human resource that we develop, if we develop them, so that we are not exporting people to go and become made in Oman or in Qatar, but to become engineers in the future. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot. Uh, so listening to the speakers yesterday and today, I have three key messages. Key message that building an effective and sustainable rule-based international order is going to be complex. In a Herculean task. Because of the various variables involved, leadership, uh, people breaking the rules, opportunistic behavior, uh, what have impunity, all that. So building that, the comp and then the institutional effectiveness, the ability to implement all that. We have institutions which are weak. So building a rule, an effective rule-based international economic order, uh, international order is going to be difficult. Must admit that. Message, and then of course the issue of strategy, I'll come to that. Message number two. I still, I'm not still clear about the state of Ghana's preparedness when it comes to dealing with terrorism and extreme uh, extremist group. I'm still not convinced, even though we have been assured that we have strategies. It's only a question of activating. What we have is reactive strategy and not proactive strategy. We need to move away from being reactive to being proactive. I don't think so. I think that we need... Uh, you see, you know, Professor Anin made a very important point about, you know, terror brings fear. If terror is going to bring fear, then, of course, the security apparatus must be up and doing. So maybe the assumption is that they are up and doing, so that's why everything is fine. But most Ghanaians are not really assured about their safety and security. And that's why the comment uh, came up that, oh, if you're in church, if you're in the market, are, you, are we safe? So the question is, are we safe in Ghana? That is what we need to be dealing with. And then message number three. I think that we need to look at the anatomy and the dynamics of terrorist groups and extremist groups. We have not been able to do that. The anatomy and the dynamics of terror groups and extremist groups. You see, because until we are able to compare and contrast, until we are able to know the difference, then we should be able to learn. But right now, because of their activity, we have not been able to learn from the attacks, the nature of the attacks, the dynamics, the anatomy, the differences, the similarities. We have not been able to diagnose that. And so I think that we need to go back to basics and deal with this issue, the anatomy and the dynamics of terrorism and extremism. I think we need to do. 
So on that note, I would like to thank, let us join me to thank the, the speakers for stimulating lecture. Uh, and then, of course, I also like to thank the audience for, you know, for your patience and being good listeners, not only good listeners, but also good questioners. We were able to bring out important and intriguing questions. Thanks a lot. As we've been thanked, we shall also thank the chairman for steering us thus far. I think it's been quite an exciting time. And uh, if it went for it being the night, I think we'd have gone on and on. But time flies. We would want to acknowledge the presence of the following schools, Accra College of Education, Accra Wesley Girls, near high school, Odogono. In our high school, Nakra girls. Thank you very much for coming again. We continue tomorrow with a climax. That is the Kwame Nkrumah Memorial Lecture. That would be delivered by Professor Alfred Otin Yeboa on the topic. Realizing, sorry, I have to go closer. Realizing the ecosystem integrity of the Ghanaian environment for national development, which shall start at 5 30. I think on that note, we've been here for quite some time to rise and to help me friend.